Chicken Pure Segment Pure Chicken Segment Pure The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess is a masterfully crafted video game within the iconic Zelda series. It transcends the boundaries of conventional gaming narratives by delving into the intricate theme of terror. Through the lens of its characters, the game unfolds a sentimental exploration of how individuals, especially children, navigate through the tumultuous waters of immense fear in almost apocalyptic events. I mean, it's revealed within its environment, a desolate and long-forgotten civilization from the Twilight Realm, apprehensive sages dwelling in the ancient Gerudo Desert, and a mysterious advanced civilization within the sky. For a game world so authentic and alive despite this murky palette and context it establishes, Twilight Princess brushes over so much creepy and disturbing lore that could have been easily brought to life. This is the disturbing side of Twilight Princess. <laughs> Ordon Village, which is nestled within the picturesque landscape of Twilight Princess, it stands as a serene testament to the peaceful and simple way of life embraced by its inhabitants, which is characterized by the rolling green pastures, rustic homes, and close-knit community that thrives on the tranquil ranch lifestyle. Amid the rustic charm of the village, the children seem to shine through, untouched by the complexities of the outside world, or at least for now. Twilight Princess's narrative has always held a special place for me compared to many of the other Zeldas, owing to the fact that it does not follow through on most of its storylines satisfactorily. The prime example of this enigma is the unexplained abduction of the children. Why exactly were the children in Ordon Village abducted? Examining the plot, we find that Ordon was on the brink of succumbing to the enroaching Twilight or so it seems, with the inhabitants transforming into spirits later on. This contradicts the notion that Twilight forces were intentionally bringing individuals into Hyrule to turn them into spirits. Moreover, the oversight becomes glaring when we consider that Bulbins inexplicably overlooked everyone else in Orden, even including Link, who was present at this scene. And if history is any indicator, things were done similarly in other provinces of Hyrule. For example, in Lanaru, the water was targeted in Zora's domain, and the murder of their queen led the city to suffer. And in Elden, the connection between the Gorons and the peculiar disappearance of the inhabitants in Kakariko was even strained, resulting in the devastation of the village due to a lack of cooperation in defending against this assault. So in a rural area like Ordona, the most effective means to disrupt life was to attack its future the children. The rationale behind this tactical move lies in the understanding that without a new generation to sustain Ordon through farming, the village could inevitably wither away. The abduction of the children, had they not managed to escape, would have heralded the demise of this village. Perhaps this was the calculated strike that aimed to destabilize their community and even leave the Light Spirit vulnerable. Of course, this entire thought process only rests on the assumption that there is an intrinsic link between the Light Spirits and the vitality and well-being of the province they live in. Even so, it's still disturbing and terrifying nonetheless. The abduction means really nothing, and Twilight Princess and the kidnapping of children isn't an easy theme to witness, which might show one of the most disturbing elements that remain unresolved within Twilight Princess.
As players, compelling writing is essential for us to genuinely experience and immerse ourselves in the hero's journey, eliciting a palpable sense of excitement or fear. While we guide and witness the hero's every move through our in-game accomplishments, Twilight Princess underscores that accompanying Link on his journey isn't merely about achieving a positive outcome. It can also show encountering a genuine sense of dread or terror from himself, his friends, and the environment around him. Similar to Majora's Mask, Twilight Princess intentionally seeks to leave a lasting impression, attempting to immerse the player in the emotional turmoil experienced by the hero. Or to put it simply, Nintendo attempts to traumatize the player within this game. And yes, that one scene does come to mind. While the scene indeed explores the disturbing theme of potential corruption of those close to you in the pursuit of power, there's just an unsettling sensation of incompleteness or even fear. I mean, Nintendo, along with many other game studios, really excels at leaving scenes like this deliberately ambiguous for the player and maybe even the hero you play, never fully explaining their narrative choices. This deliberate vagueness of what your hero experiences really just adds to this eerie atmosphere. A technique that, when me playing this game as an eight-year-old, can be especially disconcerting, raising questions about whether scenes like these contributed to the game's teen rating. A hero's trepidation that not only happens to the characters we witness, but perhaps to the players themselves. Nintendo has never been shy of doing this. But I'm not going to sugarcoat it, this Link, and perhaps the previous Links within this timeline, go through a lot. Midna and her people also go through a lot. Through trials and tribulations, they confront their deepest fears. I find that the narrative draws us in as players, allowing us to resonate with the trepidation they do face. Speaking from my own perspective as an adult player, right? The fear may not be as pronounced as it might have been in my childhood, but the subjective nature of the player's experience almost adds to the layer of this complexity within the terror. The hero's fear transcends within these scenes, and Nintendo deserves credit for successfully immersing players on that emotional journey as well. A plan between Zant and Ganon was to unite both the Light World and the Twilight Realm. While the Twilight began transforming into demons, this dark world became a partial reality. Where people were spirits, and the once vibrant essence of humanity from the Light World were now casted as mere shadows from its former glory. But the Twilight Realm wasn't the only terrifying element of this game. What lends a profound sense of darkness to the game is the overwhelming feeling of solitude and isolation. In contrast to other Zelda titles, where vibrant, interactive worlds and bustling cities provide this dynamic backdrop, Twilight Princess presents a world that seems distinctly more desolate, similar to the aspects of Breath of the Wild. While Link embarks on his solitary journey, his counterparts in the form of friends and allies, who were typically injecting lighthearted moments into the narrative, are notably absent or more subdued within Twilight Princess. Although this game does contain instances of camaraderie, they carry an eerie sense of hollowness. While the overarching theme in all Zelda games is that things will never be quite the same, Twilight Princess stands out as one of the few endings lost to its time. In Wind Waker, despite the irreversible changes, there is some sort of reassurance that Link and Tetra will embark on a quest to find a new Hyrule. In Majora's Mask, things of course will never be the same, but honestly, Link significantly improves the lives of many in Termina, so the ending is overwhelmingly happy compared to the majority of this game. Contrary to its counterparts, Twilight Princess concludes on a less decisively joyful note. This dark world is still dark, regardless. And despite defeating the evils and around and above Hyrule, things still seem empty, lost, and even bereft. When you really think about it, 
This game is just soaked in this overwhelming sense of destruction. Sure, other games touch on suffering, but not to this extent, and definitely not as vividly. In the aftermath of Twilight Princess, the notion that things will never be the same takes on a decidedly somber connotation. This, in itself, is just deeply disturbing. The history of the Twilight can be challenging to unravel. Once the prosperous tribe of the interlopers, the Twilight faced punishment for their attempted usurpation of the Sacred Realm's power. Condemned by the goddesses, they were banished to the Twilight Realm, transforming into shadowy beings. Their story reveals this tragic narrative, right? Of a civilization forever marred by their pursuit of forbidden power. But whether we realize it or not, and as it deems within the lore, these beings had immense affinity of magic, and with it, perhaps evolved their bodies into twisted beings. Beings that in which show detail and signage of their clan throughout their skin. And those who possess the most formidable magical skills eventually became kings or queens for their people. It is stated in Hyrule Historia that the Twilight wield the power of magic, though its strength does not reach the levels possessed by those who were sealed away in ancient times. And I'm going to call it like I see it. To think that maybe once mages of high rank usurp the Triforce's sacred realm leads me to believe there's more at play here. I mean, we clearly see Ganondorf throughout the legends, with his known magical prowess, and even Zelda, wielding her own abilities, which these are both attained by their powers at the cost of their Triforce fragments. But the interlopers, on the other hand, don't seem to be using Triforce power at all. So are we just to be expected to believe it was all within a few shadows ability? It just doesn't seem to make any sense. The Interlopers is the name translated and created by Nintendo of America. The translation is something different in Japanese. The Japanese text refers to them as magic wielders and sorcerers because of the immense power they possessed. The question is though, where did these magic wielders come from in the first place? One idea that hasn't received great attention is that the Interlopers were initially shadows of the people in Hyrule. Sure, this is all strong speculation, and maybe the Twilight form is likely to be their natural form within the light, but it seems to be that they're just shadows. And the Twilight are literally those who exist in the dusk. Or Twilight. When the sun sets lower above the horizon, that's when shadows appear. Whoever they are, Highlighting these consequences of an unchecked ambition of a tribe adds to the lingering phantoms of a once proud civilization. They are characterized by their distinctive anatomy, resembling humanoid birds with round bodies, feathered wings, and bird-like heads. And despite their small stature, the Uka are remarkably advanced in terms of their technology, which showcases an intricately designed civilization high above the land in floating city above the skies. Of course, this could parallel Loftwings from Skyward Sword, as both races inhabited elevated civilizations in the sky, but the Uka seem to be something else. According to Shad, they are considered the closest race to the gods, surpassing even the Hylians. Legends suggest that the Uka played a pivotal role in the founding of Hyrule, the land of Hylians. To maintain communication with the royal family of Hyrule, the Uka created a Dominion Rod. The Dominion Rod symbolizes the Uka's unique position as celestial beings, but who really are the Uka? Their advanced technology seems to be empowered by magical spells, clearly from the Dominion Rod. The Uka could be theorized to be former magic users who once lived in Hyrule's surface for a time and transcended into the skies. Another suggestion from the Minish Cap recounts a narrative akin to the Ukas, depicting a tribe known as the Wind Tribe. This group resided in Hyrule during the kingdom's infancy, only to later forsake it and retreat to the skies. Though they resemble typical humans, all members of this Wind Tribe have an innate ability to walk on the clouds, though Haley implies that this may be the result of having pure hearts. While other theories range from descendant of Loftwings, Twilight, or even this Wind Tribe, their transformation from human to bird is a really unsettling one. 
The fact that the Ukas are closer to gods than to Hylians almost makes their evolution seem to look like it took a subordinate and mutated path leaving me and many other players with a feeling of confusion about how their divine connections went awry. Legends whisper that these were the entities of one spirits of the departed, twisted into monstrous forms by their lingering attachments to the mortal world. Within Zelda's lore, Poe's just seemed to be recurring ghost-like creatures, cloaked spirits that freely roam graveyards and other haunted locales within Hyrule and its lands. In Twilight Princess, the presence of the deceased is pervasive, with its unmistakable evidence of their existence enveloping the world and its surroundings. Besides Poe's, there are phantoms, spirits, and even angelic spectrals of those of the dead, like Queen Rutella. As the Twilight converges with Hyrule, the inhabitants undergo a spectral transformation, rendering them into shapeless forms. I hate to bring up Tears of the Kingdom, but their similarity to the pose within Twilight Princess is just uncanny. And even if we delve deeper into the meaning of spirits that look like this in Japanese folklore, Hitodama are balls of fire that mainly float in the middle of the night. They are said to be souls of the dead that have separated from their bodies. Hitodama is probably what those orbs we see in Twilight Princess and even Tears of the Kingdom are derived in belief from. The souls of the departed are evident throughout Twilight Princess. As disturbing as this is, we may never know the answers to those questions, which is perhaps for the best. We as fans are instead allowed to ponder and enjoy these details littered throughout not only Twilight Princess, but the series as a whole. It's these little mysteries that make these worlds seem authentic and almost real. And of course, it's unanswered mysteries disturbing. Twilight Princess's dark, fantastical realm is one that breathes despite help from those which can't. The presence of the supernatural in this game indicates that even if the unresolved issues linger in the past, there are individuals capable of providing solutions and remedies in the present. Twilight Princess has shown me, and probably many others, that despite dark encounters and experiences, it's okay to accept that not everything will be the same. This acknowledgement of darkness becomes essential because the light is ultimately supposed to shine on this and emerge triumphant. Maybe the story and the characters aren't meant to be scary or even frightening. It perhaps is meant to show that for once, Link and the player can't fix everything. And remarkably, that's perfectly acceptable. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoy this type of content, please don't forget to subscribe and give this video a like, and I would love to hear your thoughts below, and I will see you in the next video.